Again, my name is Russ Derry. I'm the Director of Education at Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. And tonight's uh, Learn and Share conference call is uh, entitled Seizure Types, Implications, Implications for Diagnosis and Management. And we're very happy to have with us this evening uh, Dr. Tyson Burghardt from Michigan State University. And Dr. Burghardt, can you uh, just introduce yourself briefly and, and share a little bit about your background and your clinical and research interests? Absolutely. Um, so uh, my name is Tyson Burkhardt. I'm an assistant professor here at Michigan State University. I've been here for about a year and a half. Um, I went to medical school in Ohio and did my neurology residency as well as my uh, epilepsy EEG fellowship in uh, Detroit, Michigan, uh, Wayne State University. It's a bit of a second home for me. Mm -hmm. um, clinically, uh, I'm mostly interested in, in EEG and, uh, and epilepsy. That's, in fact, pretty much all I do. Um, I particularly am interested in seeing patients with uh, genetic epilepsies and, and primary generalized epilepsies like juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Um, Research-wise, um, mainly looking into uh, bettering EEG, scalp EEG for diagnosis. So the squiggly lines mean a little more than than what we think they mean. Right. Um, and uh, and also looking at, uh, at at new drugs down the pipeline. Uh, we were um, lucky enough to be a site for a recent phase three trial of a new epilepsy drug. Uh, for instance, this past year, um, and hopefully there'll be more coming. Yep, and everyone is certainly eager to see more of them, so. Yeah. Okay, so uh, before we get into any uh, detailed discussions about each seizure type, um, can you just talk about why it's important in, in making a diagnosis to get an accurate description of the seizure type or, or types that a patient has experienced? <laughs> Yeah. Um, in epilepsy, uh, history ends up being paramount, at least for the doctor. Um, if you think about um, most things that people will go to a doctor for, uh, the doctor is going to be able to see it right there. If you have a bruise or a break or something else, they're going to be able to directly examine it. With seizures, uh, we physicians rarely get to see the seizure, even with um, the profusion of video recording devices that are out there nowadays. So um, we, we have to take a careful history and we have to find out, uh, number one, if uh, the spell that the patient is going through is an epileptic seizure, uh, because many people can be treated for years as if they had epilepsy and they don't. Um, and secondly, the type of epileptic seizure that they do have gives us a lot of insight into what their therapeutic options are going to be, both short-term and long-term. Uh, there are certain drugs that work uh, much better for generalized seizures, for instance, than, uh, than, uh, than focal epilepsies, um, and even some drugs that can make seizures worse in some types of epilepsies. Um, and then when you get to um, patients who may have drug-resistant epilepsy, who have seizures that aren't completely controllable with medications, um, having an idea of their seizure types also gives us an idea of where the seizures are coming from in the brain, um, which helps us decide if surgery might be an option to help uh, either uh, diminish or eliminate their seizures. And in cases where a description of the seizure from the patient or the family member um, and a standard EEG aren't enough to confidently determine the patient's seizure type, what, what's the next step in those, t in those situations? Uh, the next step um, is really kind of dependent on the situation. Um, like I said, there is a profusion of video devices out there now. Um, so I do often ask family members to try and capture it, if at all possible. Not that we always think to to turn on our phones and switch into camera mode as, as soon as a loved one um, goes into a convulsive seizure. 
Um, but uh, that, in fact, has helped me on more than one occasion to help identify um, the type of seizure that a patient was having um, and, which, and which actually led to good therapeutic outcome. We also have uh, video EEG monitoring. Um, this will often be do, also be called an uh, epilepsy monitoring unit. Um, and these are places such as we have at Sparrow Hospital here in Lansing. Uh, they also exist in various other hospitals throughout Michigan um, where patients can be ad admitted. Um, they're hooked up to an EEG during the entire length of their stay, and they're also monitored with a video camera the entire length of their stay. They're often taken off of their seizure medications um, with the intention of producing seizures, which is obviously unfortunate, but um, in so doing, we can see uh, simultaneously not only what the seizure looks like, its features, what we in the epilepsy community call the semiology of the seizure, uh, but also what's going on in the brain electrically at the same time. Um, and, uh, you know, knowing how those two connect uh, is, uh, it brings us a lot of enlightenment in terms of what we can do for the patient. And then once you, you determine the patient's suspected seizure type, how does that influence the, the treatment you select? You've alluded to that a little bit already, but if you can talk a little bit more about how that determines the treatment type. Well, so one classic example would be with uh, childhood absence epilepsy. So um, as we'll talk about a little later, um, uh, absences are a specific kind of seizure. that are very short-lived. Um, they're pretty distinctive uh, compared to other kinds of seizures. And these, uh, in the classic syndrome of childhood absence epilepsy, you have children uh, usually between 4 and 10 who have a lot of these seizures every day. And there are really only two drugs available that work against this kind of seizure. Um, so if you were, did not know what kind of seizure the child had, there would be a, a good chance that you could choose an erroneous drug. Another example would be with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, and uh, the main seizure type in juvenile myoclonic epilepsy is myoclonic seizures. And these seizures can actually be worsened by a number of anticonvulsant drugs, um, some of the older ones, dilantin and carbamazepine, for instance. So uh, the drug choice is one thing um, that... Uh, but it's one of the biggest influences that there is. Right, right. And if you're unsure as to what type of seizure the patient is experience, experiencing, um, you know, maybe you're not sure if it's primary, generalized, or, or partial, um, but the patient needs immediate treatment, do you just tend to uh, start them on a broad-spectrum anti-seizure medication and then do further investigation and then... Uh, possibly change the medication after that. What do you do in situations where they need immediate treatment but you haven't yet determined the, the seizure type? Yeah, if it's, if it's completely uh, indeterminate, um, using a broader spectrum agent is, is, is the thing to do. And, and luckily we have a number of, of drugs just since the 90s um, that now have... Um, that either have explicit indications for both generalized and partial seizures or that have been recognized among the epilepsy community as having efficacy um, with both kinds of seizures. Um, so it's, it's not that we even have a poverty of those agents. Um, if, uh, if you are leaning one way or the other, um, sometimes a therapeutic trial of uh, what you think is the proper drug um, can help seal the deal where maybe you weren't able to catch any video or any good description of it before. Um, you know, if, uh, if you really think they're absences and you give them ethosuximide, for instance, and they go completely away with a small dose, then, right. man, you got it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, and how often do you have patients referred to you who are on an inappropriate medication, uh, possibly because their seizure type has been improperly identified? And can you think of any examples of where that's happened? Um, I wouldn't say it's uh, 
a terribly often occurrence, but it does happen. Yeah. And um, again, because because uh, many of the newer agents and, and neurologists are starting, I, I would say have been starting to use the newer agents a lot more in the past five to ten years. Right. Um, tend to be tend to have efficacy against a lot of different seizure types, mm-hmm. uh, but I have had a couple. Um, I've had um, uh, most notably, I've had uh, two young women referred to me, um, both of whom, after taking a thorough history um, and reviewing their EEG, um, it was pretty clear to me that they had um, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Uh, one of these primary generalized epilepsy syndromes I talked about, I mentioned briefly earlier. Um, and although uh, the previous neurologists had tried a couple of drugs which can have efficacy against this uh, this syndrome, um, they had not tried the gold standard, which is uh, Depakote or valproic acid. Mm-hmm. Um, and in one case, uh, the physician had actually put the patient on Tegretol as well, right. uh, which had worsened her myoclonic seizures. So once I was able to take her off uh, the Tegretol um, and uh, the other drugs and put her on Depakote, her seizures completely disappeared. Okay. So, so obviously it, it does sound like <clears throat> identifi- identification of seizure type is is important. So let's, uh, with that in mind, let's now start to talk about each of the major seizure types. And we'll start start by talking about partial seizures, or, and they can also be referred to as focal or localization-related seizures. Um, they can either be simple partial or complex partial. So let's start with simple partial seizures. Um, of all the seizure types, simple partial seizures probably feature the widest range of possible symptoms. Um, can you start by describing what what's common for all simple partial seizures and and then also talk about s- some of the major subcategories of of simple partial seizures with examples of some of the different symptoms that may be experienced. Right. So uh, the simple in the phrase simple partial seizures um, is is, uh, a a key thing because uh, by definition that means uh, that the consciousness or the awareness, uh, the responsiveness, if you will, of the patient is maintained. so the patient will usually be able to describe the seizure to you since they're aware throughout the entire thing. Um, partial seizures, uh, the partial part of the simple partial seizure uh, means that it involves uh, one part of the brain uh, first, although it may spread to other parts. So those are the major um, commonalities, uh, major subcategories. Well. The way to think about it is is this, that um, generally any part of the brain uh, can can develop as an epileptic focus, which is to say that it can be um, an area from which epileptic seizures can start. Um, and since almost any part of the brain can uh, be the start of an epileptic seizure, almost any kind of experience uh, that you can have uh, because it's mitigated by the brain, um, can be a simple partial seizure. Um, So we tend to talk about these in neurological terms because we're neurological geeks. And uh, so there are, for instance, uh, seizures in which the primary abnormality is that a person um, feels a funny feeling. Um, This can be a tingling um, this can be an electrical sensation, a staticky sensation, in some cases even a numbness. Um, in very, very rare cases, uh, there have even been reports of, of just a pain. Um, and these are felt in a specific part of the body because it's a partial seizure. Um, and they can spread because the seizure focus can actually spread from one part of the brain to another. So you may initially, for instance, uh, feel this weird feeling in your shoulder, um, and then it slowly kind of crawls down your arm uh, to your hand and so forth. Uh, that's something that, um, that we actually call Jacksonian spread after the, uh, the famous old neurologist Hewlings Jackson. Um, along with, and the, so we, we call those somatosensory or sensory seizures for obvious reasons. They're, they're sensory. Um, 
motor seizures, motor simple partial seizures, are seizures in which uh, a person will have some abnormal, uncontrollable um, movement or, or motion or motion abnormality in a part of their body. Um, and uh, the most common that I've encountered would be um, a kind of uh, um, focal seizure that might involve, for instance, uh, one of the arms beginning to shake or to jerk uncontrollably for a period of time. Um, these two may actually spread from one one part of the brain to another and may spread from the arm to the face, for instance, because of the way the brain is organized. Uh, but these are different from the classic sort of what many people would call a grand mal seizure uh, because they, they're they on one side of the body, they affect one segment, and uh, and perhaps most importantly, the, the patient is, is completely aware of what's going on. They'll tell you all about the seizure later on because they are eyewitnesses. Um, somewhat less um, somewhat less popularly known are things like autonomic seizures, and these tend to take... Uh, autonomic um, is a term which refers to the kinds of neurologic functions that are uh, sort of involuntary, things like the regulation of your blood pressure or the way that your pupils can... Uh, get bigger or get smaller depending on the light level. Um, and so autonomic seizures are those which can affect these sorts of functions. Um, and uh, for instance, in uh, some children, um, when I was a, a fellow um, looking after some pedi pediatric EEGs, um, almost the only thing you would see is that their, their pupils would get very dilated um, and they would be completely conscious. The last major subcategory are the so-called psychic seizures, and these are not seizures in which you are suddenly Dion Warwick's friend or anything like that. These are uh, uh, psychic okay, what seizures. Are they called? Psychic seizures. Okay, thanks. Um, so, in this case, it's a it's a term. It's sort of a catch-all term for experiences that are. Um, not quite sensory. I'm on the phone. Sorry. Quite all right. So experiences which are not quite sensory, but um, but but do have uh, sort of a, a deeper meaning. Uh, one of the most common um, psychic seizures would be uh, a feeling of deja vu. Uh, that's that feeling that uh, we all sometimes get, of course, which is uh, when you when you're someplace. Um, strange, someplace foreign to you, and you suddenly feel as if you've been there before, you've seen it once before, and it's very familiar even though it's not. Um, and that's that's normal for most people to have that now and again. Um, but in patients who have uh, these as psychic seizures, they'll be uh, happening um, much more often typically they may happen prior to the seizure spreading and causing some other type of seizure. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it's often uh, sort of a markedly different sort of experience. It's, it's much more intense, and it can be more, uh, it can be longer lasting. Okay. Um, a couple of uh, ones that I've heard, you know, many people mention are various hallucinations uh, that would fall under sensory seizures. Can you talk about some of the different types of hallucinations that you might experience? Yeah, uh, you're right. I did only mention the, the sense of touch, and uh, we have many others. Uh, that's correct. So um, uh, another uh, typical kind of sensory seizure would be an olfactory or a smell hallucination. Um, and so these seizures involve usually fairly briefly, um, less than 30 seconds or so, uh, a sudden smell of something strange. And it's usually described by patients as unpleasant, not necessarily bad or horrible, but unpleasant. Um, and these can be seen uh, most often with uh, lesions, masses, or problems in the, the temporal lobes, for instance. 
um, there can be visual hallucinations, and the kind of visual hallucination that comes from a seizure can depend on where the seizure comes from, uh, because from the, the very, very back of your brain, the primary visual center, um, if, there, if a seizure takes place there, um, people tend to report seeing just basic sorts of shapes or colors or combinations thereof, very uh, abstract sorts of visual things. Mm -hmm. um, there are more complicated, uh, well, let me put that another way, there are other areas of the brain to which that primary visual area connects um, that are responsible for sort of uh, extracting higher level features like, you know, finding a face within an image or, uh, or teasing out um, other details, edge, edge finding and things like that. So seizures from these higher order processing areas can actually be fully formed visual hallucinations. Uh, one of my patients, in fact, had, um, or had, because she's now on medications and is seizure-free, um, had seizures in which um, she would see her mother uh, suddenly look up at her uh, as if surprised, um, and that would be it. It was a uh, very short lived, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and and you know, we, we've obviously only touched touched the tip of the iceberg as far as possible symptoms. Like you said, anywhere, depending on where the seizure focus is, you can have a real wide variety of symptoms. Um, so many people with epilepsy don't even personally consider simple partial seizures as actual seizures. They may think of them as just auras, or they may not pay much attention to them. It, is it important to track and report simple partial seizures to your neurologist just as you would other seizures? Absolutely. Um, they are seizures. Um, they, they've gotten this term aura because um, older, you know, back in the day, people tended to notice that these kinds of seizures might precede um, the more, uh, for lack of a better term, I'll say more severe kinds of seizures, those where you lose consciousness or have convulsive movements. Um, and, and so they have this, this aura connotation as if they were just a warning of what's to come. But what's really happening is that um, the seizure is starting in an area that, of your brain that is more dedicated to sensory, that is dedicated either to some uh, sensory perception or some uh, motor perception or something like that. Um, that's when it produces the symptoms of the aura. And as it spreads to other parts of the brain, um, it may cause the more severe kinds of seizures. Our aim when we treat people who have epilepsy is to get rid of all of their seizures, and that includes uh, simple partial seizures or so-called auras. Um, and uh, evidence suggests that that is probably best for their long-term uh, seizure-free outlook. Okay, great. So unlike simple partial seizures, complex partial seizures do impair consciousness. Can you talk about the typical features of complex partial seizures and then how they can vary according to the location of the seizure focus or the age of the patient or other factors? Right. So now we've we've passed a complex partial seizures, and the complex, although it doesn't seem to have any real semantic bearing, really refers to the fact that there is some form of impaired consciousness. And this doesn't always have to mean um, that the patient is completely unresponsive. It's enough that there is diminished responsiveness or diminished attention or diminished awareness, in most cases, to call it complex partial. We uh, typically see these when they come, f when they sort of involve larger areas of the temporal and the frontal lobes. Um, classic sorts of temporal complex partial seizures um, are those in which a patient may have a, uh, a behavioral arrest. So whatever they're doing, they'll they'll just stop. Uh, they may stare off. Uh, they may have some um, sort of chewing or lip smacking movements. They may have some uh, what we call semi-purposeful movements of their of their hands or their arms, um, where they're just kind of picking at things but not really doing anything. 
they can remain standing. They don't have to fall or do anything like that. And in some cases, they may even continue doing something that's sort of semi-automatic. So a person who's um, sort of just flipping through some cards with solitaire may still kind of reach for the deck and pull a card, um, but they're not doing anything that's really purposeful. And if you try and get their attention or interrupt them, you won't be able to do that. Um, as opposed to that more typical kind of temporal lobe seizure, frontal lobe seizures, um, these can have much more violent kinds of movements. Um, and in fact, um, a lot of uh, beginning neurology residents, um, if they see a frontal lobe seizure for the first time, may, uh, because of the wildness of the movements, uh, may even think that the patient's faking or that the patient uh, doesn't have real seizures. Um, you can have uh, what we refer to as hyperkinetic movements. Uh, so these may be um, much sort of coarser or, or, or sort of uh, wider ranging movements of the arms. Uh, there may be bicycling of the legs. Uh, there may be pelvic thrusting. Um, frontal lobe seizures of the of this type may not necessarily even have a lot of uh, uh, impaired consciousness, although it often does. Um, and they also tend to occur more out of sleep than the temporal lobe seizures would, for instance. Okay. So those are kind of uh, classic descriptions of what these are like. Um, but you can't always, sometimes it's not always black and white. And uh, uh, I mean, the main reason for this is that the brain is obviously very richly interconnected. And uh, in particular, there are um, thick bands of, of fibers that travel between uh, part of the frontal lobe, um, sort of near the bottom of the brain, and the middle part of the temporal lobe. And then there are also connections between the middle of the temporal lobe and the middle of the uh, frontal lobe, uh, the so-called cingulate gyrus. Um, so these are, in fact, structures that are are uh, linked uh, by evolution. They're older structures, and they comprise a system called the limbic system, um, which is responsible for a lot of uh, emotional content and other things like that. So depending on how much of each lobe is activated, you may have overlap. Right, right. And you mentioned, uh, you know, sometimes it's not clear-cut and there might be overlap uh, between complex partial and simple partial seizures. Uh, for instance, mm -hmm. I've heard some people, typically you have, you know, little or no memory of what happened during a complex partial seizure, but uh, I've heard other people have descriptions of, you know, for instance, I felt like I was at the bottom of the pool and I could kind of hear mm -hmm. people talking to me, but I couldn't respond. So in those types of gray areas, is it is it always clear whether it's simple partial or complex partial, or is what what would be the the line that you draw? I guess. Um, you you would tend to look for for um, any real impairment of consciousness. Uh, to be complex partial, um, really because of these seizures tend to activate a wider centers than simple partial seizures. Um, they're, they're a little more complicated in, in how they look, how their semiology is. Uh, the simple partial seizures um, may have just, just one thing that identifies them. But there is another kind of simple partial seizure that can be a little difficult to differentiate, uh, and that's something called an aphasic seizure. Um, since since there are areas of your of your brain, our brains, uh, that are dedicated to the production and understanding of speech, um, if these areas are involved in a seizure, um, a person can temporarily lose the power of uh, of understanding what others say or of or of or of saying things of of creating speech, and um, if if uh, if you approach these patients um, without this in mind, it may seem that they're not very responsive or that they are impaired consciously, but it's just that they they can't understand you, they can't produce the right words, and that can be that can sometimes be difficult to suss out. Right, right. 
Okay, well, let, now let's talk about generalized seizures. Um, let's start with the seizure that most people think of when they think about epilepsy, which is a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Um, can you describe what typically happens during and after the seizure and uh, describe any variation in symptoms that may occur? Yeah, so it's uh, it's nice that everything is kind of there in the name. Uh, it's a tonic-clonic seizure. So uh, tonic uh, just means that the muscles are um, are either flexed or extended, but they're kind of rigid. And then clonic or clonus refers to repetitive muscle jerking. So uh, in the so in the classic description of a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Um, a person will suddenly become very rigid and stiff. Um, typically, the legs will be stretched out and extended. The arms may be either extended or flexed at the elbows. Um, uh, the trunk can become very rigid. Um, because the respiratory muscles are also contracting and the larynx, your voice box, is also contracting, uh, the person may let out uh, a so-called epileptic cry as the air is forced out of the uh, the um, uh, closed voice box and you get this sort of blood curdling. Not quite like that, but um, uh, somewhat similar. It's uh, it's a sound that you don't forget too uh, too soon. Um, after so the tonic phase will last for uh, a short period of time, anywhere from a few seconds up to twenty or thirty seconds. Um, after which the clonic phase begins. Um, and typically you'll see this uh, start very low amplitude, so there'll be very minor shaking but very fast shaking in the stiffened uh, limbs of the patient. And uh, over the period of the rest of the seizure, um, these, these will become larger amplitude or sort of coarser jerks of the muscles um, Usually when the jerks happen, they're kind of symmetrical. That is to say, both arms will kind of jerk at the same time. It's They won't be one and then the other. Um, and so they'll get bigger and bigger jerks, but slow down over the course until finally there's just one last jerk and then relaxation as the seizure ends. Um Finally, when the seizure ends, uh, the patient is typically going to be, number one, exhausted, number two, um, not very conscious. Um, they will often have very labored, striderous breathing. Um, they may have, uh, they will probably have produced a, a lot of saliva and other secretions in their mouth, um, which also contributes to the, the sound of the striderous breathing. Um, and after a certain period of time thereafter, which varies from person to person, uh, they'll kind of begin to wake up um, and uh, and say, oh, man, did I just have a seizure? I feel like crap. Right. Right. Okay. Is, is there much variation in in how how they look? Because I've, I've heard many people who have described seizures that sound similar to a tonic-clonic, but not quite. And, and I, I wonder, is there a yeah. lot, much variation, or, or is, are they all pretty much that classic form? No, there can be variation. Um, for one thing, um, the, the tonic phase may be shorter or longer, for instance. Okay. Um, there can be extension or flexion of the arms. There may be extension of one arm and flexion of the other, for instance. Uh, some of these variational features are part of um, of what differentiates, for instance, um, a primary generalized tonic-clonic seizure from a secondary generalized one, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Um, so uh, um, some of them may start with aversive seizure, for instance, where the patient's head uh, is sort of forced either to one side or the other, not just sort of turned to the side, but really exorcist-style forced all the way around mm -hmm. along with eyes moved to that side as well. Um, and then some people have um, uh, may have uh, may bounce back from these faster or slower than others. Uh, the clonus, the, the, the actual jerking part, may sometimes be a bit more like uh, 
rhythmic shaking than jerking per se. Um, so, you know, there can be a fair degree of heterogeneity and uh, so when we physicians are, are asking about all the details of these things, we're, we're really trying to figure out, uh, was this one or was this not? Right. And you mentioned uh, secondarily generalized versus primary generalized. Um, one thing you might do to, to get at that is to ask whether a person experienced an aura or a simple partial seizure prior to it is it ever possible for a patient to experience one but then forget it because the seizure disrupted the processing of that memory? And if so, what are some of the things that can help you d determine whether it's primary generalized or, or secondarily generalized? Right. So um, it's absolutely uh, possible for, for people to forget that, that there was any sort of warning. And sometimes uh, they may tell others that they have some funny feeling right before the seizure happens and then not really remember it afterwards. Um, the, the forceful electrical discharges of a, of a GTCS, a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, um, can, can leave the patient sort of amnestic or forgetful of, of uh, a bit of, quite a bit of time before the seizure even happened. The other things we look for are um, are signs um, that point to a lateralized or localized onset. So one of the things I mentioned just a little bit ago was the versive seizure, the tendency of the head to go clear to one side or clear to the other, or maybe it's just the eyes that go to one side or the other. Um, if the patient has uh, flexion of one arm but extension of the other at the beginning of the seizure, something we call a figure of four movement, um, that can point to one side of the brain versus the other and, and suggest that the seizure began on one side of the brain and therefore that the, the GTCS is actually secondarily generalized. Um, even, uh, even the classic, uh, I don't know if it's classic, but there's a... Um, there's the nose wipe sign uh, that my my mentor at DMC always liked to look at, um, uh, which is uh, after the seizure ends and the patient is beginning to uh, recover, uh, you look to see which hand they use to wipe their nose with. Um, and, the, <laughs> and the reason that, that this seems to work, um, and there is, it is sort of sensitive, uh, is because of a phenomenon called Todd's paralysis. Um, so patients who have seizures that begin on one side of the brain that are focal seizures and then generalize, they may have weakness um, in the part in the on the half side of the body controlled by the hemisphere of the brain where the seizure started. That's called Todd's paralysis. It's a weakness that's temporary. It goes away. It goes back to normal with time. It is sometimes confused with stroke in ERs. Uh, much to my chagrin, um, and then uh, uh, these patients, since uh, some of them have Todd's paralysis following a generalized seizure, and so they will tend to wipe their nose with the uh, with the arm that's less weak. Uh, so it tends to point uh, uh, to one of the hemispheres as uh, as being the origin of that seizure. Right. Right. Okay, so on the op opposite end of the spectrum, we have absence seizures. Can you describe what these look like and what they feel like, uh, and uh, including both typical and atypical absence seizures? Yeah, and and these are uh, so absence seizures are are kind of seizure that um, many people who are just beginning to learn about epilepsy or study epilepsy, or many of my residents, uh, trainees, for instance when they're first learning about epilepsy, um, will tend to confuse with complex partial seizures uh, because the absent seizure is, is um, associated first and foremost with um, a, a behavioral arrest, a complete um, sudden loss of consciousness. Um, and as we were talking about before, complex partial seizures, the complex part um, defines it as affecting consciousness in some way. Uh, the main differences are that absence seizures have a very uh, very quick onset. 
Um, they typically will come on just like that. Um, they tend to last for only a short period of time. Um, in children with typical absences, um, they're around 10 to 15 seconds, sometimes 20 seconds, 30 at the very most, although that would be a little unusual. Um, and then when they end, they end very, very abruptly as well. And unlike with a complex partial seizure where a patient, after the seizure ends, may be disoriented, confused, they may be tired and lethargic, after an absence seizure ends, uh, the patient is often unaware that anything's even happened. Um, it's as if their brain shut off for a few seconds and then came right back on. If it weren't for the look of surprise on their on the face of the person they're talking to, they might not know that anything happened. Right. Um, these are the kinds of seizures that happen in children, and um, the teachers may complain uh, to parents, for instance, that they just daydream all the time uh, because they try to get their attention and they, they're off in la-la land. Well, in this case, they're not off in la-la land. They're having a generalized absence seizure. Um, the difference between typical and atypical absences, uh, depending on whom you ask, either depends on uh, what the EEG looks like or what the absence itself is like. Uh, the typical absence is, in its clinical features, is more or less identified with the kind of absences that you have in childhood absence epilepsy. And this, this is a benign form, relatively benign form of epilepsy, uh, that I mentioned earlier happens to kids between 4 and 10, um, although usually actually more like between 4 and 7. Um, and uh, they're, like I said, very short-lived, very abrupt onset and offset. Um, during the seizure, the child will um, have almost no movements. There won't be the kinds of um, lip smacking or... Uh, fumbling with the fingers that you see in general in uh, temporal lobe complex partial seizures, although there may be a little bit of uh, eyelid flickering at times. Um, atypical absences um, are absences which may last a bit longer, uh, which may have an onset which is not quite as quick. So it may come. Uh, so the, the patient may more gradually over a period of seconds sort of lose consciousness and then more gradually over seconds come back to consciousness. Um, they can last more like 30 seconds, whereas that would be uh, fairly long for a typical absence seizure. Um, and on EEG, on a brainwave test, they, they tend to look a bit differently. The um, EEG in childhood absence epilepsy is, uh, is a very uh, strict three cycle per second spike in wave. So you see three spike and wave discharges for every second, um, whereas atypical absences may have uh, faster or slower spike and wave responses. They may have poly, sp poly spike and wave responses. Um, much of this terminology may not be may not be germane to many of you, but um, but uh, it's something that uh, epileptologists and EEGers um, will look at when we're when we're looking at these. The other thing with absence is uh, that uh, I know I saw a YouTube video um, of a, a father who was trying to show off his his son's absence seizures. So so he had him hyperventilate, and sure enough, he had an absence in in this YouTube video. So hyperventilation tends to produce the absences, uh, which can make them a little easier to diagnose in the EEG lab. You have the kid breathe real hard for a couple minutes, um, and they can have an absence right there. Right. And uh, you, I know they're more common in children. Do, are, are they rare in adults or just a little less common than in children? They're, they're, I wouldn't say that they're rare. They are less common uh, than in children. Um, the... The high incidence in children comes from the fact that there's this age-related syndrome, the childhood absence epilepsy, which I spoke about. Um, but the majority of kids who have childhood absence epilepsy grow out of it. 
and uh, and don't have any further seizures the rest of their lives. Adults can have absences. Um, they're a feature of several different um, generalized syndromes, such as juvenile absence epilepsy, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which, despite the name, also has generalized tonic-clonic seizures as well as absence seizures, um, epilepsy with myoclonic absences, um, eyelid myoclonia, um, a range of other syndromes. Um, and many of these that occur in adults may be uh, are, are more atypical absences rather than typical absences, um, and they're uh, in fact they may even be uh, either so brief or so subtle um, that uh, the patient or even even uh, trained neurologist might not notice them unless they're all looking at an EEG. Mm-hmm. That would be particularly uh, common with um, uh, uh, generalized epilepsy with phantom absence is a fairly rare syndrome. Okay. Um, so another generalized seizure is a myoclonic seizure. Um, can you just describe these and how they can vary? Right. So myoclonus, um, again, the, the clonus part tells you that there's some some, some sort of, uh, of a jerking going on. The myo just refers to the fact that it's a muscle, which is sort of redundant. I'm not sure why it ended up being <laughs> called this. Um, but uh, so the the main difference between a myoclonic seizure or and a seizure which involves you know clonus like the generalized tonic clonic seizure is a myoclonic seizure would be a single brief sort of jerk, um, and uh, you know the the textbook myoclonic seizure uh, generalized myoclonic seizure is one where a person has uh, more or less a whole body uh, jerk. Um, and sometimes these are somewhat gentle. Um, sometimes they are violent enough, and I've seen them violent enough to fling a 180-pound young man right out of his hospital bed, including over the uh, the sidebars. Oh my goodness! Yes. <laughs> um, patients may not even notice that they have myoclonic seizures. Um, in some cases, they. Uh, uh, they may just say that they're clumsy. For instance, um, a lot of patients with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. The only way to finally get them, you know, get them to tell you about their myoclonic seizures is to say, "Well, you know, in the morning when you're brushing your teeth, do you ever notice that you, you know, sometimes you're really clumsy and you like fling the toothbrush out, or you, you know, you drop your your cup of coffee in the morning quite a lot." Um, one patient of mine. Um, I was monitoring in the unit. Um, she had generalized discharges, and uh, I felt like she probably had juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, but we couldn't capture a seizure for the first day or two. She woke up during the middle of the night one uh, uh, the, the day before she was discharged, and uh, we looked on video, and um, in fact, she, she reached for this cup next to her bed, um, it was a you know styrofoam cup full of water with a top on it, and as she was bringing it to her mouth, um, she had a jerk, and she she came very close to flinging this cup all the way across the room towards the camera. And uh, when I asked her about it the next day, she's like, "Really? That happened?" And I said, "It actually happened several times." Um, and once I showed her the video, she's like, "Oh my God, that's what those are." And like I was saying, although like the textbook myoclonic seizure um, is sort of a whole body jerk, um, in practice they they may actually involve only segments of the body. Even though it's a generalized seizure, sometimes uh, we actually see them affecting just one side or the other, although typically it won't stay on one side. People may have a jerk on one side and then a jerk on the other may involve mostly the arms and shoulders and some people may involve other body parts. Um, So um, both uh, tonic and atonic seizures can cause sudden falls and they're often referred to as drop seizures or drop attacks. Can you talk a little bit about each of these seizure types and how to distinguish between them? Yes. Thankfully, these seizures are a little less common than than the other ones because they can really be devastating. Um, Tonic seizures, uh, we talked about how uh, 
tonic and tonic clonic means that there is uh, rigidity in the muscles. And so in tonic seizures, you don't have the clonic part, you just have the tonic part. The person will become uh, very rigid very suddenly. Um, and with that rigidity, uh, the straightening of muscles and so forth, um, they absolutely will not be able to maintain a standing position um, and will tend to, since they're stiff, they will tend to kind of tip over, sort of like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, if they'd never shorted up. Um, whereas with atonic seizures, uh, the A is, you know, uh, like you would notice in other words, it means without. And so in these seizures, there's a loss of tone. So the muscles kind of instantly become jelly-like. Um, and you would imagine that in this case as well, there's no way you could stay in a standing position. Uh, but unlike the tonic seizure, where they would tend to kind of tip over, in the atonic seizure, they'll kind of more or less crumple down into the uh, into their own sort of footprint. Um, the people who have these kinds of seizures, especially um, frequent ones, are uh, are the people that uh, you may see um, wearing helmets out in day-to-day uh, -to -day life, um, although there are other reasons why they would. Um, because uh, when you have seizures that can suddenly... Uh, bounce your skull off of the pavement at any given time and unpredictably um, looking a little silly and wearing a helmet is the last of your worries. Right. And uh, uh, what determines with, with atonic seizures, because sometimes they can be just a head drop, what's the difference mm -hmm. there between the head drop and, a, and your full body dropping with an atonic seizure? Uh really just a a difference in in terms of um of uh, extent and uh, of the discharge itself okay. um you're right to point out that uh the atonic seizures may in, you know may not involve a full on drop um and sometimes it does just involve a little bit of a a, a head droop um these those in fact are sometimes confusable for other seizure types um, because uh, in atypical absences, there may be a little bit of a head movement. For instance, um, with complex partial seizures, they may move their head a little bit. Um, so getting the history is really important. Seeing it on video makes it much more distinguishable, typically, um, although uh, EEG always helps. Right. Um, and then, just like there can be, there, there's the tonic half of tonic clonic. There's also the clonic half. So there can be clonic seizures. Um, mm. I've read that they're fairly rare. Are are they rare? And 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 also, can you uh, describe just what happens typically with a clonic seizure? Yeah. So uh, the clonic part, of course, is this clonus. So this is rhythmic jerking, um, and this is uh, I mean, pure clonic seizures of the generalized type are rare. Um, we mentioned um, simple partial motor seizures earlier in the talk here. Um, and in and, and those seizures, for instance, there can be clonic or arrhythmic jerking movements of, of, of one limb, for instance, um, in that you would describe that or a doctor would describe that as clonic. But a clonic, uh, generalized clonic seizure is one where um, there's uh, usually bilateral uh, like both arms um, rhythmically jerking. Uh, they tend to happen more in infants and children. Um, they can be associated with uh, various kinds of developmental delay. Um, and, uh, yeah, they are fairly rare. Okay. With, with um, uh, uh, related to that, hemiclonic seizures, I've, I've read about those as well. Are those, um, would those fall under the category of simple partial, or are those slightly different? Uh, those are a little different, okay. um, yeah, because uh, they involve widespread discharges um, and, and clonus of sort of the, an entire half of the body rather than a, a focal segment. Um, and uh, they tend to be syndromal, which is to say they, they're associated with a um, specific set of, of named syndromes. 
whereas uh, the, the focal clonic seizures can happen from uh, lots of different lesions affecting the brain. Okay. So just uh, along those lines, there's a couple other seizure types that may not fall in any of the categories that we've talked about yet, like infantile spasms. Are, are there any other seizure types that we should mention uh, that kind of don't fit into these categories? Um, infantile spasms are an interesting category. Uh, they only happen, uh, they're actually now called epileptic spasms by the International League Against Epilepsy. Okay. Although um, they they are basically uh, limited to uh, to infants, um, uh, and these are uh, usually um, either uh, these are sudden uh, movements, either sort of uh, of the arms out or 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 in towards. So it's either as if the baby seems um, really surprised and is in free fall with arms coming out. <laughs> Or, or maybe like the baby is is suddenly trying to grab something. For instance, uh, they're very sudden. They can happen many, many, many times a day. Um, and part of the reason that this is limited to infants is because um, the infant's brain is not yet fully. Well, how do I put it? Uh, the, the wiring is there, but not all of the insulation is. So um, uh, the the discharges, the epileptic discharges, propagate in a little bit of a different way, um, and they tend to produce these things. Um, there are rare other kinds of seizures, such as gelastic seizures, uh, which is a kind of inappropriate laughter. Um, and even rarer than that, there are decristic seizures, which is an inappropriate crying. Um, uh, gelastic seizures are associated with one specific uh, disease, which is uh, a kind of tumor in the hypothalamus. That's an area sort of on the bottom of the brain. Um, so uh, if you identify, uh, usually it's, a, usually it's a, a younger person, a child. If you identify someone with gelastic seizures, um, then one of the things you're going to look for is whether they have one of these uh, specific tumors. So while most seizures fit clearly into one of the seizure type categories that we've discussed, there are some that probably don't. Can you give some examples of seizures that maybe were eventually proven to be epileptic but didn't match the textbook definitions and could have easily been misdiagnosed as, as being non-epileptic or something else? Yeah. Um, um, one of my f favorite cases was a woman... Um, who had an orgasmic aura. Um, she had simple partial seizures consisting of an orgasm, um, which uh, a lot of people, when they first hear about it, are like, oh, man, is that a problem? But actually, if right. you think about it, it's a huge problem uh, <laughs> because how could you ever enjoy intimacy with another person if, um, if the goal of that is to feel like you're having a seizure? Um, interestingly enough, this woman had um, originally had auras of thirst. She would be very thirsty when she was a child. Uh, but once she hit puberty, uh, it turned into an orgasm aura. Um, some other interesting ones uh, I've seen. Uh, I've seen patients who had um, a kind of reflexive seizure, um, usually... You don't expect that uh, that doing something to a person can elicit a seizure unless you're, you know, actually like injecting a seizure drug into them. Um, uh, certainly, you wouldn't expect that uh, that doing ref that testing knee reflexes could trigger a seizure. Um, but we, uh, when I was a resident, we in fact had a, a patient um, where we were able to prove that that's exactly what happened. So what are these called? Uh, well, that's, uh, I mean, it's generically just a reflexive seizure. Um, okay. um, there are rare examples of all sorts of stimuli uh, triggering seizures, and the seizures they trigger can be uh, complex partial, they can be generalized seizures, um, uh, lots of different types. Um, there have been reports of seizures caused by reading, um, which sounds like an absolute horror to me. 
Mm. Um, there are, in, in certain pediatric uh, syndromes, there's a fixation on or fixation off seizures. So when a child fixates on an object and then looks away, uh, that can trigger a seizure. Um, people may be more familiar with uh, light-sensitive epilepsy. Um, this is the case where you know people may have heard of uh, uh, Japanese epileptic children, for instance, having seizures because of the flashing lights in certain Japanese cartoons. Although uh, that's, of course, much much rarer than the than the public understands. I used it to, to have be. one when I whenever I heard a siren. Is that right? When I was little, yeah. And my yeah. aura was uh, just the pain of the world. Oh, interesting. I, I've heard of audiogenic, that is, you know, sound-generated seizures, but uh, but I've never actually seen one in person. So in uh, regards to the photosensitivity, you mentioned that it's fairly rare. It's only like 3 to 5% of people with epilepsy have true photosensitive seizures. But I, I hear a lot of people talk about avoiding TV or video games or computers or the they can't sit at the computer for too long or flashing lights bother them. Is is photosensitivity prevalence higher than this, or or is it that, or do you think that people's fears uh, that they're photosensitive are, are actually unfounded? And then maybe if they've had a situation where they were had a seizure that was triggered by what they thought was photosensitivity, that, that yeah. is it possible that it was actually just stress because they were worried that they were going to have a seizure and they right. kind of made themselves have, have a seizure? Is that what do you think is going on in those circumstances? So I think that um, the true photosensitivity is is pretty rare. Um, there is a possibility that it that it may be a little higher than what's been reported, and the reason is. Um, so, for instance, uh, I mentioned bef- by analogy, I mentioned before that hyperventilation can can make absent seizures come out. Um, but sometimes you have a kid with absences, and you know they have absences, and you know that hyperventilation has triggered their absences before, and they're giving you a great effort at hyperventilating, but it doesn't trigger anything. Right. Um, you know, when we're doing these EEGs, and how many EEGs does a person with epilepsy ultimately have? I mean, even if they have it for a huge section of their life, they may only have a dozen or so EEGs ever, and they may not be photically stimulated in each one of those. And so we're going to say on the basis of how many of them had a a proven epileptic response to uh, brief photic stimulation during one of maybe a dozen EEGs uh, that they're not photosensitive. Mm. So it it may be a little more prevalent, but um, um, based on my gut, I don't I don't think it's it's nearly as uh, I, I think a lot of cases are probably uh, mistaken. Right. Okay. Um, so so most people are are familiar with convulsive status epilepticus, which is a, a convulsive seizure that lasts for 30 minutes or more, or or recurrent seizures that last for 30 minutes or more. But uh, a lot of people um, may not have heard of, con- of non-convulsive status epilepticus. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure how common that is. I know there's multiple types, but um, can you talk a little bit about uh, non-convulsive status epilepticus and how common it is and what, what some of the most common symptoms are and is it more common in certain subpopulations? Or? Right. Um, just briefly, first I want to I want to touch on something that, that you mentioned with convulsive status epilepticus and with, st- and with status epilepticus in general. Yeah. Um, and and you, you had mentioned that, that this is a seizure which lasts longer than, than 30 minutes. And and this was the traditional definition of status epilepticus. Um, uh, nowadays, in in the epilepsy medical field, um, we have shortened the time considerably. Um, we consider status epilepticus to be any seizure which lasts longer than five minutes, oh. or any series of seizures, um, any cluster of seizures uh, that happen so frequently that the patient doesn't really come back to themselves in between. Uh, and the reason that, that the consensus to shorten this so much happened is because... Um, do we still have a connection? 
Okay, there we go. The the reason that this happened was because, um, especially with convulsive status epilepticus, the sooner the, that, well, it, especially with convulsive status epilepticus, the sooner it gets arrested, the better. And um, the majority of seizures, which last longer than five minutes, are un, are unlikely to stop on their own or require medications. Okay. There are a small number of seizures um, that that can last five minutes or a little longer and would probably eventually stop on their own. Uh, but we accept um, that these patients may be, may be treated um, sort of, I hesitate to say inappropriately, but, but, but treated even though their seizures would have stopped on their own. We accept that uh, so that we can uh, more quickly get to the, more quickly arrest the seizures of the patients in which they won't. Right. Now that said, uh, non-convulsive status, um, in the broadest sense, is status epilepticus or seizures lasting longer than five minutes or recurrent seizures, which don't allow you to get back to baseline in between, as I said before, um, in which there isn't the the sort of generalized tonic-clonic or the the convulsive major motor sort of manifestations. Um, And there are a couple subtypes um, in children, for instance, uh, there's absence status epilepticus, uh, which is probably the most benign kind, actually. Um, unlike other forms of status epilepticus, children with prolonged absence seizures uh, tend not to have much actual brain damage from it. But these would be absence seizures that just go on and on and on and on, or multiple absence seizures uh, where the child doesn't really recover in between. Um, what we tend to worry about in the hospital uh, is um, a complex partial status epilepticus. Uh, so these would be uh, seizures that are partial. They come from one part of the brain. they complex, which is to say that there's impaired consciousness, um, and they keep going, and they keep going, and they keep going, and they don't stop on their own. And the patients may be doing anything from um, sort of absent-mindedly and haphazardly um, uh, interacting with their environment, seeming a little off, or they may be completely stuporous. Uh, there's a wide range. Um, among the people with who have these kinds of seizures, there are, there's a, sort of the group of the walking uh, non-convulsive status uh, people who are in status but will wander around in the world and, and just seem uh, to others like they're uh, maybe homeless people or something. Uh, and they usually respond very, very well to a, a little dose of medication. Um, the people who are sicker, uh, people who are in the hospital with other illnesses, especially with neurological problems like strokes, traumatic brain injury, things like that, uh, tend to get forms of partial status, ep- partial and non-convulsive status epilepticus that may be very hard to treat. Um, and uh, in, in in fact, uh, according to some studies, it depends on which ones you want to believe, um, anywhere from 8% to 30% of the patients in a neurointensive care unit may be in uh, non-convulsive status epilepticus at some point during their stay. Uh, what's worrying about that is that the signs may be very subtle. The patients are stuporous. They can be stuporous or, or not very interactive. Um, if they're interactive, um, their uh, sort of um, lethargy or, or nonsensicalness may just be put down to the fact that they have a brain injury or that they're drugged up or something like that. Or the stuporous patients may have only brief eyelid flickering or, or, or brief shaking of one finger or limb, something like that. And uh, if they're not washed constantly, it can be missed. Um, And in some cases, the status may not have any physical manifestation at all. And in those cases, the only way you would ever know that the patient was in non-convulsive status epilepticus was by doing an EEG. Hmm. Okay. So um, 
we, we mentioned some of the postictal symptoms, the period after the seizure. Um, obviously, drowsiness and confusion are, are fairly common, maybe headache or even depression. But what are some of the more serious symptoms you might experience uh, postictally, and is there anything caregivers should do to respond to those symptoms? Yeah, in in most cases, um, you know, pe- in most cases there'll be drowsiness and confusion, and all you really need to do is be supportive, um, get them to get them to bed, for instance, or or, or, or gently reorient them. Um, in some cases, uh, there can be quite severe reactions, uh, post-ictal psychosis. Uh, in which following a seizure, a patient becomes uh, very violent, very agitated, uh, disconnected from reality, um, do happen. Um, they've happened a couple times uh, when I was a resident. I, I got to see the room get trashed. Um, <clears throat> uh, in those cases, um, you, the caregivers, you don't really want to try and... Uh, and confront a, a patient who's raging like this because they're going to be, number one, hopped up on adrenaline, and, and number two, um, uh, their state of mind will be such that, uh, uh, you know, they're not going to necessarily recognize you or be gentle. Uh, so you'll want to, as much as possible, try and make the environment safe, um, try and soothe and try and be very calm and, and help the patient through until the episode passes. Uh, we talked about Todd's paralysis, and, and that's something that will go away on its own, given time. Um, uh, caregivers will want to, to make sure that if there's a new caregiver or someone new around, for instance, that they don't respond to Todd's paralysis by thinking that it's a stroke and, and uh, putting the patient potentially through uh, a costly and dangerous hospital stay. Um, is postictal depression ever so severe that it can actually put the person at risk for suicide? There have been cases reported where that happens. Um, and, uh, I mean, mood disorders and anxiety disorders are already uh, common in people with epilepsy, um, more common than you would expect by chance. Um, and epilepsy is even more common in people with depression than you would expect by chance. Um, so there's already this existing um, issue um, that's very, uh, you know, that can lead to a lot of problems for patients. Um, following a seizure, um, a lot of your neurotransmitters have been depleted. You feel like you've been hit by a truck. Uh, if it was a convulsive seizure, for instance, um, you feel very tired. You may feel many patients will feel disappointed, for instance, if this is a seizure that happened after a long seizure-free interval. Um, and uh, the important thing is to to keep their mind on, on getting well, on maintaining the things that we know that can help their seizures, taking medications regularly, avoiding things that can provoke them. But yeah, in uh, in rare cases, um, it can even provoke suicidal feelings, and uh, in those cases, you'll you'll want professional help. Okay. Um, last last question is the International League Against Epilepsy, which you mentioned already. Um, there, there's been some suggested changes in terminology. For example, the term "simple partial seizure" might be or has been replaced. Uh, at least in one thing that I read, by focal seizure without impairment, in, without impairment of consciousness or awareness. So <laughs> this new terminology is, is might be more descriptive. It's also more wordy. Uh, would you say uh, neurologists are still sticking with the older terminology? Have, have, is there a split? Is there a rift? What's uh, wh- where are we going in the future with with terminology on these? Yeah, this is a this is a big pet peeve of mine about ep- epilepsy. The medical epilepsy community is they can never settle on one set of terms. Um, um, even even terms like simple partial, complex partial seizures um, are out of favor with some neurologists. 
um, because uh, and and a lot of the impetus for the new terminology um, comes from this idea that uh, maybe we shouldn't be describing seizures in terms of you know what they are like electrically, which you won't be able to tell all the time mm -hmm. uh, just watching it. Uh, but but what actually happens uh, besides the ILE ILAE new proposed terminology, uh, which was first proposed in 2010. Um, there are other terminologies, such as um, the semiological seizure classification scheme, which is popular uh, with people who studied with Hans Luders at uh, Case Western, or people who studied with people who studied with Hans Luders, mm -hmm. uh, such as myself. Um, and and these are this is a a way of talking about seizures, which does focus more on the actual uh, clinical findings rather than is it a generalized, is it a focal, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of heterogeneity. Um, I don't know many neurologists who are using the new 2010 terms uh, because they are very wordy, for instance. Yeah. Um, and they seem unnecessarily wordy, and um, you know more and more doctors are are on the computer for their electronic medical records, and no one wants to type out that much stuff all the time. Right. Um, the the terms that we've been using in this talk still have a lot of currency, especially with general neurologists. Uh, the semiological classification has some currency um, among lay people. Um, you know, we tend to get descriptions like grand mal or petit mal, um, and we use this, we, we do use these when we talk to lay people if that's sort of the the best level of understanding that we can establish between us. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but hopefully um, with uh, most patients who have epilepsy, we can uh, help educate them about the specific kinds of seizures that we think they have um, okay. with terminology that's a little more exact and more clinically relevant. Right. Okay. Well, I wanted to open it up for questions. Um, uh, again, to unmute your line if your line is muted. If you have a question, you just dial star six. Uh, does anyone have a question? Yes, yes I have a question. Okay. Um, for Lennox Gastaut syndrome, what kinds of seizures are, do you see? So, for those who don't know, Lennox, <clears throat> excuse me, Lennox Gastaut syndrome is uh, a syndrome whereby patients have uh, multiple seizure types, uh, usually developmental delay. <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, and they also have a distinctive kind of EEG finding. Um, depending on whom you talk to, um, the definition might require that one of the seizure types that they have are drop attacks, um, but not everyone says that that has to be the case. Uh, patients with Lennox Gastaut can have multiple seizure types. Um, you see generalized tonic clonic seizures. You see, you can see focal um, motor seizures. Since most patients with Lennox Gastaut are fairly moderately to severely developmentally disabled, um, you may not get many reports of sensory uh, type seizures, um, but they can happen as well. Um, tonic seizures, atonic seizures, the so-called drop attacks. Uh, tend to be common with them as well. Um, the interesting thing about Lennox Gastaut is it's a syndrome, it's not a disease, which is to say um, patients with a wide variety of diseases causing their epilepsy um, can all sort of converge to a very similar looking epilepsy syndrome, and that's what the Lennox Gastaut syndrome is. So patients who have West syndrome as infants, for instance, or patients who have Dravet syndrome, or patients who have uh, tuberous sclerosis leading to focal seizures, uh, they may all end up, um, after evolution of many years, with a similar-looking picture of Lennox Gastaut with multiple seizure types, drop attacks, 
uh, slow spike in wave on EEG and developmental delay. I have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I uh, the last conference I went to was a lot about negative and positive energy, and in first grade I made a conscious decision that I would not hurt. I would do everything I could not to hurt another person. Mm-hmm. And I even wrote a poem a couple years later, basically, you know, giving my life to God. But the last line was basically, no, I mean, the knowledge that life was hard. Mm-hmm. Um. And uh, I started having seizures soon after that, and they're very symbolic. In the, the first one, I scraped the food off the plate and put the plate on top of it, as if to say I'm not being fed here. There was a lot of abuse in my family, mm. and I carried a lot of negative energy. Sure. I even have things go on in this apartment where the TV will go off by itself and on by itself, and and the uh, channel changer sitting on the table. Right. Or, or the energy will go out in nobody else's apartment, um, but but in mine. Interesting. So I'm wondering if it could have any... I haven't had a blackout for a while. I've dealt with a lot. My writing has gotten so much better. I wrote 11 pages the other day and didn't... I mean, I may have crossed out one or two words. Yeah, and my reading is so much better because I've forgiven those people. Um I, I am definitely the family scapegoat, and I have. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing a book mm-hmm. um, about how but, we need to learn to love. All, that's why we're here on this planet to learn how to love. I believe. It sounds like you have a lot of material for your book uh, with I all the things you've been do. through. Uh, I won't we use know, any names because I could put some people in prison. I could. We certainly know that um, that many people associate extra stress. With uh, with extra seizures, um, and uh, in my experience, putting people into the epilepsy monitoring unit to try and capture their seizures, for instance, um, sometimes they don't have seizures, and um, even even people who had seizures every day, and we put them in the epilepsy monitoring unit, they don't have any for five days, and. Uh, one of the most common explanations they have, I don't know if this is true or not, but one of the most common explanations they will give us is um, that uh, the hospital room they have, it's a private hospital room, we have a new EMU so everything's nice and shiny. It's up on the ninth floor, it's got a nice view, the nurses take care of everything. They say it's too calming uh that if they're at home and they had to uh and they had to you know do chores and and get the kids ready and and put up with their husband and all this stuff that they would have a seizure in no time uh but the but since we put them in a, sort of a medical spa that's why they didn't have a seizure hmm. so um you know mind and body are are certainly intertwined and uh hmm. uh it's it's it should be no surprise that um that a person's epilepsy, a person's seizures can be, uh, can both influence and be influenced by that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Other questions? Talk yes, I have one. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Uh, in describing um, juvenile myoclonic seizures, does the juvenile mean it starts when they're young, or is that, does that mean something else? Yeah, so... It's an abuse of terminology. Um, everyone's got to have their jargon, right? So, um, uh, so uh, there's in epilepsy, um, you'll hear about some syndromes classified as childhood something or other, and uh-huh. this usually means that they happen before the age of ten. Okay. Um, and then juvenile syndromes, uh, such as juvenile myoclonic epilepsy or juvenile absence epilepsy, uh, begin in the uh, the early to late teens. Okay. Um, can I just describe this seizure to you? It's a full body uh, shiver with a guttural uh uh. But she doesn't lose consciousness, she doesn't fall down, but it's happening more and more and more than ever before. And she's had, she's had epilepsy for 40 years. Mm-hmm. How can it be changing? I mean, like, it seems, it seems weird that she's not, before she used to have. Chronic time, chronic time, chronic time. That's all she had. And then she started with the, the complex, and now she's doing this other thing. It seems so odd. Right. It's, um, 
you know, epilepsy is an evolving disease. Uh, many people think of it as a static thing. You have your seizures, and they're your seizures, and, um, you know, you take medications, neither stops it or doesn't, but um, it can change over time. And we know, for instance, um, that a number of people um, having uh, who have seizures get on medications, and then after two to five years of being seizure-free, they come off medications, and they never have another seizure in their life. Um, on the contrary side, um, you have patients who may have had excellent seizure control for 24 years. I have several patients like this, and then you, nothing changes. The drug is the same. It's, it's the same generic manufacturer. They're taking at the same time. They're not taking anything new, but the seizures come back. Um, and. Mm-hmm. We're only beginning as neuroscientists to understand all of the things that go into this. Um, one of the things that's probably implicated is the fact that um, if you think of uh, of how you learn, for instance, um, you kind of, when you learn something new, you're reinforcing some of the same circuits in your brain over and over until they're very strong. Uh, when seizures happen over and over, it's almost as if it's teaching those circuits in your brain to seize more easily. Uh-huh. Um, and as they do so, they may eventually start to kindle or to to produce seizure-like activity in other parts of the brain that weren't active before. Um, and even if a person is controlled, uh, if a person has no seizures on medications, uh, there may be subtle electrical things going on um, that don't produce symptoms, for instance, but that are changing some of the connections of the brain. Mm-hmm. Um, although ultimately, I have to say, um, a, a definitive explanation is still wanted. I have a question. I have, I have one more here. Hey, I'm not quite finished. Um, the, I've been calling those seizures that she has um, uh, partial complex. And when you were describing the frontal uh, lobe seizures, it said like a violent movement that could throw her out of bed, which happens frequently, bicycling of the legs. He said something out of sleep. Does that mean it mostly happens during sleep? Um, frontal lobe seizures. Yeah. happen during sleep. Yeah, they, they, can occur, they can occur in sleep, and, and frontal lobe seizures tend to occur in sleep more than other seizure types. Um, okay. So much so that if a patient shows up to my clinic and they describe only seizures at night while they're asleep, um, I already begin to suspect their frontal lobe seizures. Okay, thank you for the clarification. No problem. Um, I just had a quick question. Yeah, um, this is Toyota. Um Hi. Um, I had a question about night tremors because I used to think I was crazy because I would feel like at night my bed was shaking and, like, it would wake me up in my sleep and I would, like, my heart would be beating really fast. I used to think I was, like, having some psychological breakdown. But I read about night tremors. So can you kind of talk a little about that in terms of what, when people have those, what type of seizures do they usually have? Um, I'm kind of unfamiliar with what you mean by night tremors. Well, I read about it, and it says basically it's when you, maybe like when you're sleeping and you kind of, you're actually having a seizure, but you don't know you're having it, but you kind of, like I said, it just feels like the bed is maybe shaking or something. So when I told my neurologist, he said it was night tremors. Okay. Um, so so there, are a num- there are a number of things that, that can happen to, to people uh, at night around the time of sleep, some of which are seizures and some of which are not. Um, certainly, um, patients can have focal motor seizures with 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 trembling movements or shaking movements. Okay. Um, and these can happen at any time, uh, uh, including at night. Um, there are other non-epileptic phenomena, some of which are completely normal, such as sleep myoclonus, uh, where okay. during sleep you may have a sudden jerk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or hypnic jerks, which uh, I think most most people listening will be familiar with, where you uh, you're drifting off to sleep and you suddenly feel like you're falling, falling. and you jerk away. Yeah, yeah. Right. I that's have those hypnic all. Jerk and that's that's pretty normal. Uh, okay. And then there are things like uh, restless leg syndrome or periodic leg movements of sleep, where 
um, a person may have uh, uh, basically irresistible urges to to move the legs um, either while lying down or during sleep. Um, okay. And sometimes uh, the irresistibility may be described as as actual involuntariness. Okay. So, uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. No problem. Okay. Okay, so I, 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 I do think we have to wrap it up now because uh, I don't want to keep you any longer. But um, I want to thank everyone for for uh, listening. And if anyone does have any remaining questions, you can certainly feel free to call me and or email me with those. And if if I'm not able to answer, you know, maybe I can uh, email Dr. Burkhart and, and ask if he has any uh, thoughts on that. But um, Dr. Burkhardt, I really want to thank you for, for the time and, uh, and really fascinating information, and, and uh, I think everyone probably learned a lot. So thanks, everyone. We did. Thank you very much. Burkhardt. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. You just explained my whole life. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, really? You did? <laughs> It's yeah, been my pleasure. Uh, I just found I wasn't diagnosed till I was 28, and I just found out I've had it all my life. Oh, oh man. Well, well, better late than six. never. I was six months old. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, and I didn't even know. I knew. Well, you just explained it all to me. Well, it's been a, a great pleasure to talk to you all. Um, I thank you for listening. Uh, um, and uh, Thank you very uh, much. Thank Just you. Uh, stay healthy, everyone, and, and be good. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. All right, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.